Hello everyone. Um, today is a different kind of video to what I would normally post on my YouTube channel and it is the first time I am ever having a guest on which I'm so excited about and I hope it is the first of many more guests but the first guest I am extra excited about because today we have Irene Yu from Skip Level On and before I let Irene introduce herself because I have done my research a little bit of stalking on previous interviews you've done I'll do a bit of a spiel on what I understand your journey to be, and then I'll like hand it over to you. So Irene started her career as a software engineer. Um, I know you've worked in um, sort of the advertising space before. You've also worked in big tech, specifically Amazon. And through those various experiences, you have worked with different types of product managers, obviously. And through that, you have arrived at this opportunity that I think it really exists in the market around upskilling PMs technically. And then you really took that opportunity by the hand and you are now the CEO and founder of Skip Level, which is a uh, technical uh, training platform for product managers. And when I wanted to get you on, I really struggled to think about what, what specifically can I talk to Irene about? Because I want to talk to her about obviously skip level as a product, because I, as a PM, resonate with that so much. I want to talk about your founder journey. I want to talk to you about working in big tech and transitioning out of that. Um, and also just being a female in, in this space, I find really interesting. So that's my little overview of you, Irene, and your journey, but I'll, I'll hand it over to you to say hello and like, tell us something interesting about yourself, maybe. Yeah. Hi, Anika. I am uh, so excited to be here with you. Um, I know we've worked together in the past. Um, and so when you invited me to be your first interviewer, no, interviewee, I'm sorry, I was really excited about it. So thank you for having me on first and foremost. Um, and hi to, to your audience. Um, I am Irene. I am the founder and CEO of skiplevel.co. Um, it is a, a company where the mission is to help product managers feel more confident in their technical abilities um, and to feel more confident in their ability to work with and communicate with devs um, and move forward in their technical career. So uh, I, I am a software engineer. I've been a software engineer for, I think, the last maybe 10 years. I actually started uh, coding um, when I was around 10 or 11. It was a hobby. Uh, turns out it was a pretty cool hobby. It was a pretty lucrative ho um, hobby. And, um, you know, it's uh, turned out pretty well for me. Um, and now, you know, here I am. Yeah. Did you ever think when you went into software engineering that you would be doing what you're doing today? Like, did, did that ever cross your mind? No, you know, not at all. When I first started doing software engineering, it was actually a very organic process. I never actually thought to, you know, start out being a software engineer, you know, again, it was a hobby that I wanted to do. I actually started out doing graphic design okay. and I moved into web design. I, I really wanted to make my website pretty. Again, I was like 11. Yep. So that's when I started doing um, HTML and CSS and front end development. Um, I actually studied business in school. And then when I came out, I realized, wow, people actually paid you to code. Um, and so I, I came out of college, not really knowing what I wanted to do. Um, and I eventually found my way into web development and then software development. And that's kind of how it happened. So it was a very organic process, but I, I love it. I think it was absolutely the, the right path for me. I think it speaks to a lot mm -hmm. of my skills, um, a lot of my passions. So yeah, it was awesome. I love that. Thank you for sharing. I'm always very fascinated with the path someone has taken in their career <clears throat> because some people know what they want to do and they pursue that but other people kind of stumble along the way based on different opportunities that opportunities that come their way or ideas that they have um and i think especially as a founder you can come from any background um Definitely. and so i think it's always interesting to know how you got where you are so thank you for that okay so thinking back to when i first came across skip level um, I think it was back in 2021 or possibly even late 2020 when I started my TikTok account <clears throat> and I started posting about really just educational content for product managers. So mm. TikTok back then was kind of known as the place that you go and dance and, you know, kill some yep. time during the lockdowns. Um, but I actually saw there were a lot of other tech creators on there talking about engineering and design. 
and no one was really talking about product. So I really mm -hmm. le lent into that and just started making videos about like the practical things uh, you do on a day to day or month to month basis as a product manager. And I think aside from the technical stuff, there are just so many things in product management that are difficult or unknown mm. like there's never really a black and white as to how to do something and I was like you know what let me just share my experience of how I do things and yeah it really resonated with people so I think I stumbled upon skip level at that point and I was like this is a genius idea and it's really <laughs> cool to see a few years later like how how you and your your team and your product has grown I wanted to quickly share my story of being I don't like to put a label on it, but I guess a non-technical PM. Mm. Um, so I, the last product role that I had, which was at a, a big tech company, um, Zendesk, that was my first official product role. I'd done product roles before. I've had a few startups in the past and I've, you know, kind of just making stuff up as I went along, as you do. But at Zendesk, I was officially a PM with a scrum team. And over the years that grew into multiple scrum teams and I was working on integration products. So very technical. Mm, yeah. Yes, there was a UI layer, but really it was how is data flowing in and out of various systems? How do we authenticate? And I really struggled. <clears throat> like I had to lean on my engineering team so much because quite frankly, I had no idea that everything that went into making an integration product work. Um, yeah. So that, that's been my experience, but I feel like through that, um, I've, I feel like I've picked up a lot of different techniques uh, along the way that helped me to build a really good relationship with my engineering team. And I'd love to get some practical tips from you um, today as well. Um, and, and I'll, I'll also share mine. But yeah, as someone who's been in that boat, I know how challenging it is when you're working with an engineering team. And I get questions like this from my audience all the time. Like, I don't know what my engineering team is saying, or mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm i stuck in a meeting and the engineers are talking and I don't even know how to interrupt because I don't know how to ask the right questions. So I really want to make this practical and, and share some, you know, tangible things that people will be able to do. There's a few different areas that I'd love to focus on today. One, a little bit about your career slash founder journey and like the transition out of big tech to startup land. Yeah. Um, I'd love also to talk a bit about your product skip level and how you do product management yourself at your own company or how you think about it. And then, of course, the practical tips um, that I mentioned. So uh, I might start with the founder journey. So I'm really curious, Irene, like what has been your hardest challenge to date as a founder? I love that we're starting here because, you know, where do you start <laughs> when you when you start a company and you're a founder? There's so many things that go into it, and I have a lot of thoughts from it. So I was a software engineer at Amazon. I was there for three and a half years. I was originally going to quit Amazon uh, April 2020, but as we know, that's when COVID hit. Everything shut down, and I you know, kind of got scared. And I was like, okay, maybe now is not the right time to quit everything and like a very secure job and do this really risky venture on my own. So I waited another six months, uh, had another stock vest. And then in October 20, uh, uh, 2020, I left and I went full time on skip level. And, you know, I'll be honest, everything was hard. <laughs> um, every part of it was hard. When I first started the company, I was basically building for the first maybe four or five months. And that I was really good at because I'm a software engineer. But I went from having a very structured environment to basically no structure at all. I had all this free time. I could do whatever I wanted with it. I had no accountability. You know, I had zero team members. Also, this was during COVID. So it was quite yeah. lonely because I wasn't really going out. I wasn't really seeing friends. Yeah. And so that was really hard even figuring out, well, how do I structure my time? I mean, I could wake up at 11 a.m. Mm. and do nothing, right? So that was hard. After I built my product, I built my website. I had this instinctive moment where I said, oh my God, now what? How do I, how do I launch this product? How do people even buy from me why would they buy from me you know and this is funny because i actually went to school with a concentration from marketing 
in marketing. Mm -hmm. And I still was like, how do I launch a product? I had no idea. So, yeah. so that was a really kind of terrifying moment. And I, I had a whole month where I just sat on it. Right? Yeah. Um, and um, I finally got up the courage to launch uh, May of 2021. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I, you know, launched, um, I quickly realized I had to be on social media. Mm -hmm. How do you be on social media as an influencer when you're a software engineer, you're just kind of behind your computer, you're just working by yourself. So that was really hard. Um, yeah. Doing sales calls. I've never done sales before. I had to figure that out. That was really hard. Growing a team was, yeah. you know, really hard. Um, but I think if I really had to choose the one thing that's been the hardest that I think a lot of founders don't actually talk about is the emotional aspects of being a founder. Mm -hmm. Because when you go from <clears throat> big tech, which is all structure, all certainty, right? Everything's figured out for you, really. And you go from complete risk, complete uncertainty. If something goes wrong, you can't really point to anyone. There's no manager you can blame, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for you to get your next meal, I'm not meal, but your next paycheck, it's yeah. entirely up to you. The, the next steps yeah. is entirely up to you. Yeah. And your identity is kind of tied into this business. And not only that, but kind of your survival is yeah. tied into this business. So, so then your body and your mind, for whatever reason, comes up with so many fears, fears of failures, fears of success, a lot of anxiety, and that manifests in a lot of procrastination. So there was a year and a half where I really wasn't growing the business much at all. Wow. Because I just couldn't handle these emotional yeah. things that came with being a founder. I would pretty confidently say that at least 70% of founders mm. struggle, especially yeah. first time founders struggle with this sort yeah. of anxiety. Um, and it's just not, a, you know, something that's really talked about. And I bet a lot of founders actually, yeah. their startups fail because of burnout, because they can't handle the emotional turmoil, the ups and downs of all of it, yeah. uh, which is why, you know, most startups have two founders. So you have some accountability, someone to be there for you. Um, yeah. I'm completely a solo founder, but thankfully I have an advisor who's also a life coach that's been able to kind of help me confront some of my fears and actually work through them. And mm. now I can say I've kind of come out on the other side where I've been able to overcome some of these fears and now I'm a lot more Amazing. productive. But yeah, yeah it's a, a really big, big part of being a founder that is has, yeah. has really been the hardest journey for me. I feel like that was such a loaded question I asked you because, yeah, like everything is hard. Um, yeah. A few things really stuck out to me from what you said. So it almost felt like with all of the different things you had to, to learn um, in terms of, yes, there was building the product, but then you had to market, then you had to do sales, then you had to hire. It's almost like you, you know, tying it back to product management in a way, you kind of had to go through that entire mm -hmm product development life cycle, but on a much larger scale, like yourself, everything that is done in a big tech company where you've got like teams on teams to support you from different cross-functional areas, you're kind of that team now and you are your own cross-functional partner for everything. Um, and yeah, like the building is one aspect of it, but then you can build and then what? So I, yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point to touch on. And I, I think another interesting thing is when you see a product, right? Like let's say back in 2021, I saw skip level. Um, I probably thought like, wow, these guys really have it together, but you have no idea what is going on behind the scenes. Like when you see the product and like the quality of, of what you were doing back at back then, like I would have never known the things you've, you've just said. So I think it's really interesting to, to bring light to that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that, um, I kind of want to uh, relate back to product management and something that I always say to people who ask me, like, what should I go and study to be a product manager? Or what is a course I can do? I always say to them, look, there are things that you can go, like there are resources that you can go in and read and, and try to apply and everything. But fundamentally, like you kind of just have to throw yourself in a situation where you have an engineering team, you're building a product and you just kind of figure it out. And that's, you're only really going to learn doing it and on the job. Like just reading the theory is never going to get you all the way there. Um, and I feel like you've done that with, with the startup is 
you kind of built the thing and then you you figured out everything else so yeah yeah i i have to say my marketing concentration didn't come as much in handy as i wish it would have you know a lot of it is theory i mean a lot of the stuff that you learn in yeah. college really is theory. yeah 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 um so i was gonna ask you something oh my god i blanked um i was gonna ask you one second okay so you mentioned that you spent uh six months or, or maybe a bit longer like really just building skip level how did you firstly know that you would have enough demand for it like did, did you know that you had enough product market fit by that point to say it's worth me actually building this because you always hear that you should do an mvp and test it and get feedback so how did mm -hmm. you approach thinking about that yeah this is actually uh this is actually advice that i actually give folks that are looking to do a startup or have an idea that they want to do. I do say that first, don't quit your full-time job. <laughs> don't first, don't quit your first time. Um, don't quit your full-time job. Actually validate that there's actually a demand for this thing before you sink all of these resources and resources means your time, your effort, money, right? So, I validated through two ways. The first way that I validated was through my own experience as a software engineer. You know, I worked for 10 years as a software engineer. I've worked with so many product managers in so many different industries. I know from my side as a dev that this is a really big skills gap that no one really is filling and how it, how it really affects developers product managers, teams, and the company as a whole, right? Because the communication there is just not as efficient or as effective as it can be. So that's one. Uh, two, um, I, so through my experience as a software engineer, I actually did this thing called tech mentorship and I mentored a product manager who really had the courage to come to me and tell me she was really struggling. Like the way that you were talking about how you were struggling. So through mentoring her, I realized, you know, there were so many things that she didn't know that I thought was common knowledge. And it made me realize like, oh, why would this be common knowledge for her? You know, as an engineer, every single day, I get the opportunity to learn software, right? Actually do it. But product managers don't have that opportunity. So why would she know that Git and GitHub are two entirely different things, right? GitHub's actually a company and Git is a version control system. So and and then I also saw that she really wanted to learn, but there were no resources for her, you know, because most of the technical education was created for devs, not for product managers, specifically for the product management role, because the 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 sorts of information that you need, um, training that you need as a dev is different from that of a product manager or sales or design or marketing. So that's one, just my own, you know, firsthand experience. The second is once I had this idea, I actually set about, and what I did was, th so the best way to validate an idea is to get people to actually pay you for it first. If it's possible, if your product actually allows that, get people to actually pay for it because that's when you know there's real demand. So I actually posted in a Facebook group for product managers and you know I just wrote a post about, a course that I'm teaching, a live cohort that I'm teaching on the weekends to teach technical training. And I had, I don't know what I was expecting, but I had 200 people comment. That was incredible. I was blown away. I was not prepared. And I had to quickly scramble to do an Excel sheet and get phone numbers and like reach out to, to each one of them. Uh, that's where the sales calls came in because I, I did a total, I think of 12 or something. The first I was, you know, my first time doing a sales call is the first six couldn't get off the phone fast enough with me. Uh, I realized I was like, I'm doing something wrong. This doesn't feel right. The last six I learned and the last six, the calls went longer. But then most of them, I converted, I think, five of them. And they actually asked me, so how do I pay? So, so that was these, pretty incredible. Were these individuals or were they businesses? Individuals. This was okay. individual product managers. Right. So at that point, they actually paid me this money before I had created the product. That's when I was like, oh, you know, there's really like real demand for this. And that's when I set out to quickly create the course. And that's when I taught it on the weekend. At that point, I realized there was a lot of demand. So I, I already validated 
I continued to teach a few more students. And so those two experiences and my vision for a, uh, a tech industry that is more equal in terms of education and technical education uh, really was what made me feel confident about um, quitting a highly secure job at Amazon um, and going full time on skip level. Amazing. That's a, uh, yeah, there is nothing like you're solving a, a, a problem that you have seen firsthand, um, but then getting the demand for it before you even had. So like, I guess for you, your MVP was doing those weekend like training. Yes. Training sessions, right. Like you didn't have to build mm -hmm. something for your MVP. You were, your knowledge was the MVP and you were giving it to a group of people. Yeah, I mean, I, I did have to come up with the curriculum with the content and, you know, okay. create that. But yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, one of the things you mentioned uh, reminded me of a, a small practical thing that I started doing when I was, you know, in a struggling position is when you said like Git versus GitHub. So I actually started to keep a glossary. Like I had my notebook and it was as new terminology would come up, whether it was in a meeting or a random conversation. I would just start writing the definition or I would write the word and then I'd go, I'd go re research it later. And that really helped me because these, these words get thrown around like, like it's no one's like business. Candy. <laughs> and yeah. It's, and the acronyms, especially in tech, acronyms are everywhere. Yeah. And um, I, I, you know, eventually I got to a point where I was actually really comfortable just saying like, can someone explain what that means? Or what yeah what does that stand for and I think oftentimes when you have someone who is comfortable asking you know silly questions even though they're not silly I, I think it's also helpful for others because I did eventually in my in my group at Zendesk I eventually had another PM join who was also non-technical and it was actually really helpful to have two of us because we could kind of pair up and I don't know team up against help each other <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah help each other support each um, other yeah yeah, so that was that was handy. Um, okay, so that is a little bit about skip level, how you got started, um, how you knew you know there was enough to kind of go all in, uh, and I'd love to understand a little bit about how you do product or how you mm -hmm. think about product at skip level. So, I guess you're kind of wearing the hat of founder, CEO, and PM. Yes, and everything else maybe. I don't know how does how does that work? Yes. How do you I guess prioritize? what, what yeah you do. right I think that's a really interesting question because your you know the priorities of a CEO is a little bit different from from the product manager right I mean it's kind of related but it's like slightly you know different product managers you want to provide as much value and you want to think about the product engineers want to build the product and then um, the CEO is like well I want more money now <laughs> so um I think though how it's related and the way that I see it is if you can provide more value to customers, then, you know, that revenue will follow. And so uh, that's kind of how I think about it. The other thing I think about it is when you're a CEO, your task list never ends. There's so much that you can do. And there's so many, honestly, products that you can create, right? I could create software and say, you know, this is beneficial for my product managers. And it is, right? Um, but one of the ways that I kind of bridge these two things is I always think, and maybe this is a software engine, this is like the soft, like, I'm sorry, this is the lazy software engineer me. But I always think, how can I get as much as I can get for as little, to do as little as possible? So, so basically I'm saying, what's the highest scalability th that thing that I can do that will provide as much value to customers, but take as little of my time as possible, right? So what's very, very scalable and what's something I can do once and then I can just repeat it without as much effort. So I, I kind of always think in, you know, that way. And so I, when I was working in, you know, big tech companies, we would do this thing called an OP1. And basically the, the managers, the product manager would get in a room and they would figure out, well, 
what are the biggest problems that our customers are facing and what are the solutions that we can build for them? So it's like, you know, it's like defining what the vision is, what the problem solution is. And then that kind of gets funneled down to like the engineers to build. So I kind of have the same uh, method, probably because I learned it working in big tech. But I think every year, at the end of the year, I think about, well, what are my goals this year? What are my, you know, revenue goals, my targets? Um, uh, and then I, you know, create product launches that I think are really important. Well, first, I, I actually do interviews. So at the end of um, the course, whenever students take a course, I actually ask them, are you open to doing an interview with us to get feedback on the course and to kind of see, you know, what else we can offer you that's a value that can help you in your career. Um, so then I actually conduct these interviews, I'll actually, you know, email my students, get feedback, you know, get ideas from them, uh, which is really so inspiring. There's nothing more inspiring than actually talking to your customers and and hearing what they want from them. Um, and then using that data and then, for, you know, for myself as a company, kind of setting what are those projects that I know that I want, want to actually accomplish for this year. And then from there, every single sprint, we would kind of look back at the business plan, the quarterly business plan, and kind of come up with um, the plans to actually do all of these things. And I, I try to do, I try to do one launch uh, per quarter. Mm -hmm. um, either it's a, it's a new feature in our course, new content in our course, or just something completely different. And that's mm -hmm. kind of how I think about product. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's like taking the the almost like the really robust processes that exist in big tech and like almost taking like a mini version of that and applying it to 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 your to your startup. Um I am curious, this is something I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but I know a lot of product managers um struggle with this. It's not a technical thing, but mm. curious for your take on it now as a founder. Have you ever had a request come in from let's say a potential really high paying customer or a customer that is currently paying you, let's say a lot of money, they're a significant customer for you and they want you to do something bespoke for them or they want you to do something that maybe you don't think the demand from all your other customers is there. How do you balance those like one-off ad hoc requests? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good question. And it actually did happen just last year. Yeah. So I had a, a really, I'm not going to name the company, but it's a very large multinational company that I think, I mean, you'd kind of have to live under a rock not to know the name of this, this company. Um, and they, you know, they're a very old company. They've been around for a really long time. Um, and they wanted to train the entire product org across, you know, the whole world um, in technical training. And, it's, it just so happened that one of my students who took my program, um, she was working at Amazon at the time. She jumped over to this company and she ended up telling the VP of product about me because she really loved the program. So, so the VP of product at this company reached out to me and they essentially wanted to do live trainings uh, in, I, I think, three cities around the world. I think one was London, Australia, and then Texas. And, uh, and, you know, it would require me and like the amount of work it would take because they wanted, you know, custom content as well. They had a very long list of things that they needed to train, you know, their product managers in and they wanted it to be custom. So, you know, at that point, I would have had to drop a ton of normal business operations in order to service this customer. But you know what? It would have been like a big injection of like VC funding. You know, so in, in that case, it would have been very worth it, I, I think. Also, because the process, doing the process, it would have been very hard. But going through the process of creating this training for them, I probably would have come up with new products um, that I can then, you know, give out to um, other companies or other uh, product managers as well. Um, so that pro versus con uh, seems like a very heavily weighed towards pro you said this was last year so did that end up happening or you still working through it <laughs> well you know b2b sales is corporate sales is a very long sales cycle and unfortunately the the um the person at the company that i was liaisoning with left the company oh. and whenever things like that happens projects will fall behind the wayside right so um yeah. okay we'll see hopefully they come back one day but well if anything that is 
so much validation again for what you're doing totally. and just shows the the level of the problem and the opportunity so yeah and there's there is only you know hundreds and hundreds of companies out there that that would would have product managers um and i know i know it's not just product managers there's also like um designers and sales staff teams and lots of other people that would benefit so that's a great problem to have i'm excited to hear that and i and i hope that comes back around um okay so maybe what we can do now is in the last maybe 10 or so minutes or we'll see how we go we can get into some practical tips yeah. for let's say someone who is watching this video um let's say they are in a situation right now where they are really struggling uh day to day working with their engineering team they're not technical they've got responsibilities and accountability for their product but they yeah are really struggling to understand the fundamentals that come with, um, uh, you know, maybe having to make product decisions that require them to have technical understanding, making trade-offs, even just communicating with their engineers. Um, I get questions and comments and emails about this all the time. So I'm pretty sure at least one person watching will resonate. Um, so yeah, thinking about that person, I wanted to ask you, yes, they can go and, you know, sign up to skip level and they can go and upskill themselves that stuff will take a little bit of time mm -hmm. so what do you think one thing they can do like immediately like tomorrow to try and yeah. help? it could be the smallest thing but what yeah. do you think your advice would be to that person it's a great question and the first thing i would say to this person that's watching is i want to let you know it's okay mm. it's totally okay your product manager no one expects you to be highly technical. Developers don't expect you to be highly technical. So wherever you're at right now in your technical ability, it's okay. You're at the perfect place. Um, so that's the first thing. Just take that off your shoulders. Mm -hmm. The second thing, you know, a lot of product managers that I've mentored, that I've worked with, they later tell me, like, first, I don't know how to ask the right questions. You know, if engineers say they can't do something i don't i i don't know how to push back i don't know what questions to ask so, so this was really kind of what you were talking about right and then the second thing is they oftentimes say i'm afraid to ask questions because i'm afraid of looking stupid which is totally valid i think that that's totally fair here's what i would say to that when you're um first of all if you don't ask any questions you really can't grow you really can't learn right I understand the fear, but I would say this as a software engineer, and I can say this on behalf of all software engineers, uh, all software engineers, uh, don't expect you to be technical too. They love it. When you ask, they love when you show curiosity in what they do, which makes sense. Right. I mean, even you as a product manager, don't you love it when other people are like, tell me more about your work, you know, like I would love to learn more and you know, you feel great. Cause I'm like, I feel like such an expert. And so Devs also love that. Devs love when product managers who are not technical ask them about their work, ask, you know, questions about technology. For them, it shows a lot of curiosity and they don't expect you to be them, you know, because you're not them. Um, but just seeing that a product manager is willing to learn is really big. Um, even if you don't know what an API is, it's, it's okay. Developers want to teach and they want to have the opportunity to to talk about their craft right to talk about the projects that they're working on and how they built something um so don't be afraid to ask mm -hmm. those questions because i promise you even if you ask once immediately you're going to learn so much mm -hmm. so that's uh one uh the first thing the second thing i would say is the caveat here is be careful of when you ask the question, right? So mm -hmm. let's say you're in a technical discussion and it's six other engineers and a product manager and you know engineering manager. And let's say it's like a 45 minute meeting and you're really not technical and they throw out 25 terms you've never heard of. You don't want to stop them at every single, you know, every time you hear something that you don't know, because that's really going to derail the, the whole meeting, <laughs> right? It takes a long time to explain an API, right? So instead, do what you did, Anika, you, you know, when you hear a term you don't know, write it down. And then later, ask a software engineer to say, hey, there were some things that I didn't understand. Could you help explain that to me? 
And, and, you know, I can guarantee that the majority of developers will say, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to help. So that's two. The third in that same vein, and this is a very practical tip is the best way to actually learn technical information is to ask open-ended questions. So instead of what is questions, like what is an API, you want to ask open-ended questions. So for example, um, how did you build this feature and why did you build it this way? Um, and if you were to rebuild it again, how would you build it and why? All right. So okay. here's a practical tip. Find a documentation. Usually developers have documentation. Um, ask for an architecture diagram. Mm -hmm. Look for that architecture diagram, dissect it, set up a meeting with the dev, and then go through that diagram with them. Because that's going to go through every single piece of the system. It's going to touch on everything. It's going to touch on microservices, which is architecture. It's going to touch on infrastructure, cloud services. It's going to touch on API. It's going to touch on data. Um, and then and then throughout that process, you can ask what is questions, but then you also want to ask those open-ended questions. That's really going to make like the difference in um, you being technical and being able to contribute to conversations because you're understanding technical trade-offs, right? No solution in, in technology is going to be perfect. How do engineers think about it? What are the trade-offs that they think about when they're coming up with a solution? So that's easy. You know, just go look for documentation, set up a meeting, uh, ask all the the silly questions that you want and ask all the open and the questions that you want. And I promise you're going to walk away being like, wow, I just learned so much. And also, wow, there's so much more for me to learn. I'm just nodding and nodding and nodding because I agree with, yeah, obviously agree with everything you said. Um, and I, I think I've applied a lot of those things myself. Um, and just a mini plug, I do have a video from a couple of years ago on questions to ask engineers. So I will link mm -hmm. that below for everyone. I should probably do a refreshed version based on some of the stuff you just said. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll add on from my own experience. One thing I've really found helpful is finding just that one engineer, right? Like you've got a, mm -hmm. you've got a team, a, a dev team, you know, you're going to have a different relationship with every person in that dev team. Find that one who you, you feel like a little bit safe with. Um, you know, there, there are, there are different personalities at play. Um, some people are more receptive, some are more patient. Um, so I think at least I like to say, like, find your one ally, um, and, and, and not use them, but like partner with them. Um, and something I like to, to do or, and have done in, in terms of the architecture diagram you mentioned, I will take something like that and, you know, book a meeting with, with that one engineer I really trust and have a good relationship with. And I'll say, okay, let's draw this out on a whiteboard, you know, luxuries of in office life. Um, and I want you to explain to me how stuff works, like as I'm drawing it out and get them to like really explain every box, every line. And I think to your first point, I think engineers especially like love explaining how stuff works. Like at the end of the day, it's totally it's so logical. And you always think about how to build, how, how something will work and how to build it in the best way. And if you can share that with someone, then yeah, you're, you're going to be all up for that. So I think, yeah, get them in a, find one person, um, pair with them, do one-on-ones and don't, inter, you know, don't take over like group sessions um, and keep a glossary, write down things and be, yeah, be curious at the end of the yeah. day. Yeah. yeah. And now you have chat GPT. So and now you have multiple allies. Yeah. But I, yeah. I, I, I love that word, Anika ally, because I think that's yeah. totally right. Um, yeah. And some engineers, you know, they communicate differently. You know, yeah. some engineers are very engineering mindset and yeah. it'd be a little more difficult to communicate with them. And some other ones are able to kind of bridge that like hmm. product translation with yeah. technical implementation, as I say. So yeah. definitely um, I, would even say to get multiple allies mm -hmm. actually because mm, totally. because software engineers don't all have the same skills. Yeah. You know, I was a front end engineer. I also did back end engineering. My front end engineering is probably a little bit stronger. Mm. And I might have built the front end portion of the app. I might not have built on on the back end portion. Mm. So, you know, different software engineers have different expertise. Um, so you want to find as many any you know software engineer allies as as possible that you feel comfortable with um, yeah. and they might give you a lot more insight into different parts of the app and different parts of technology yeah 
Yeah, that that I love I love that. Um, I think one thing that I think is uh unfortunate in the relationship between product and engineering is I feel like product managers put like there seems to be this pressure that hangs over over us in terms of like you need to just know what the decision should be. You need to be able to make that decision clearly, black and white, and that you kind of should just know all the answers. And so what I always say to product managers that I talk to is you're always making decisions in collaboration with your team. You are getting input from engineering, from design, from marketing, from like the business, or maybe even from other product teams. So just remember to take that pressure off yourself because you're probably more so facilitating that decision. And yes, ultimately you, you're the decision maker for your product, but you are like the information gatherer. And so in terms of being curious, just think about going to gather information from your engineering team. And I think all of the question asking and everything comes into that. So I don't know why, you know, a lot of PMs think like, I'm just expected to know this and you'd hand it to everyone on a silver platter. <laughs> But yeah. yeah, I think that's a really good point. And um, it also helps me as a software engineer, you know, kind of seeing things from the product management perspective. I think there's a difference between, um, I, I, I personally don't, I, well, at least I'll speak for the engineers. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the engineers expect product managers to have all the answers, but mm -hmm. engineers expect ownership. Yeah. So ownership doesn't mean having all the answers. Ownership could be owning the fact that, yeah, I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to own is setting up a meeting with designers, mm -hmm. setting up a meeting with engineers so yeah. that I can tell them, Hey, this is a problem that I'm facing. Uh, I kind of want to hear your input, yeah. like from your experience, you know, mm -hmm. like if this was the problem, this is the problem we're trying to solve customers. How would, how would you solve it? Yeah. What's the solution you would give? And this is something that I actually did for uh, product managers that I worked with. I would actually sit with them during the ideation phase and talk them through like, well, if we're going to build it. You want to build it fast. This is the simplest way to build it that would solve that problem. So I think that's kind of like the, the the difference between expecting product managers to have the all of the answers versus expecting them to own um, own the project. Yeah, yeah. And just to clarify, I feel like PMs put that on themselves. It's it's great to know that that expectation is not there, but I feel like it's a it's totally it kind of yeah it's like this comes with the territory of like I should just know, and I I'm always like no you you don't have to know. Um, I realize we've been talking for quite a while, but it feels <laughs> like we could keep going. So what I might do is um, we can end on uh, two questions. So one, I'd I'd love to know if you have um, obviously there's skip level, and we'll talk about that to end off with. But do you have any other recommendations for free you know i'm talking like basic resources whether it's blogs or newsletters books yeah. that people can um can you can use as resources to to upskill technically yeah uh yeah definitely so um i have a few resources the first one is there's actually a 10-day email mini course called tech essentials for product managers where i actually teach you um some hard technical skills for product managers um, and that's completely free. And you can sign up for that uh, at skiplevel.co slash email dash course. Okay. Um, and then once you sign up for that, you'll also get added to my free uh, skip level newsletter where every month I share a tech term, but I also share a tech, um, but I also share like a tech essay where um, I might teach, you know, how to gain influence and build trust with engineers, or I will actually teach you a technical um, concept like APIs or data or something like that. So you'll get automatically added to that. Um, and then there's a bunch of free resources um, on my website, uh, for example, tech terms, definitions, stuff like that. Um, and you can find that at skiplevel.co slash free dash resources. I've been signed up to the skip level slash Irene's newsletter for a couple of years. And I can say it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. So definitely sign up to that. Thank um, you. Cool. And then to end with, um, anything you would like to, to share in terms of skip level, if someone is like, that sounds interesting. I don't know if it's for me, like talk us, talk us through that and, and who it might be useful for and, and yeah, yeah. How, to, how, to, how to sign up. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, the the beauty of the skip level program is that it was created for product managers. Uh, so one of the concepts that I teach product managers who are trying to become more technical is that, you know, it's very overwhelming. And the reason why learning technology is so overwhelming is because there's two dimensions to it. First, it's it's very broad, meaning there are so many verticals that you can go down, right? Data, infrastructure, system design, uh, the software development life cycle. I mean, just deployment, how do you deploy software? I mean, there's like thousands of books just written on that. So there's a lot of, uh, um, there's a lot of verticals, there's a lot of breadth. And then in each of these verticals, there's depth, right? You can go really, really deep into each of these topics. I mean, tons of college courses on each of these, um, uh, uh, topics and, and the deeper you go, the deeper you go into implementation, right? So what I teach product managers, they get overwhelmed sometimes because they think that in order to be technical, you need to go really deep. In reality, as a product manager, the first thing you want to do is you want to go really broad. You want the fundamentals in each of these verticals. Once you have a, a, a grasp of each, each of these verticals and you understand how they all fit in, then you can start going deep. So, uh, so it's this concept that my uh, program is actually created for. Um, and it's also, uh, not only does it teach all of the core verticals that you need to do, uh, uh, to have all of the fundamentals, you also do hands-on exercises, which I think is extremely important. Sometimes product managers, they try to take a coding class, uh, and that's really deep into implementation and they realize they come out of it and they haven't really learned anything because those aren't you know, when you're a product manager, you're not expected to code, right? That's not what developers are talking about when you're sitting in a technical discussion. So the hands-on exercises you actually do are actually things that you might actually work on um, when you're a product manager, but you also get exposure to hands-on tools, tools that developers actually use. So now the next time someone, you know, a, pro uh, um, a dev on your team says, you know, we're using Postman to do this. Well, there's an exercise where you actually use Postman. You learn about APIs. You actually use Postman. You actually mock an API. You design a, uh, um, you actually design the API schema based on a product that I tell you about. And so now we're bridging product requirements to the technical implementation using a real tool. So there's exercises like that in um, inside of the program. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really geared towards product managers. There's also a community where you get to ask questions uh, because it's technical information, right? I mean, watching a video is one thing, but actually getting feedback on your exercises, being able to ask clarifying questions um, is extremely helpful. So, uh, yeah, if you wanted to check it out. Um, oh, by the way, it's not just for product managers, really anyone in sales, customer success, design, um, it would be really useful for. So if you wanted to check it out, you could go to skiplevel.co um, um, and there's a bunch of resources on there, program preview. There's a page to see if Skip Level is right for you. And um, yeah, you can find out more about the program. Amazing. Thank you. And I will leave all of the relevant links below. Um, I also, I think I made a video on Skip Level many, many years ago. So I'll link that below as well if anyone wants to have a look at that. Um, and yeah, thank you, Irene. This was, I feel like I kind of just scratched the surface of everything I would love yeah. to talk to you about. Um, so just a, a parting note to anyone watching, if there are particular areas um, that you want us to deep dive into. So for example, if you want us to get even more into like, what are the practical tips for you as a PM working with engineering. Um, leave those questions or suggestions below. And, and Irene uh, has kindly offered to potentially do a follow-up um, if, if there is enough interest. So yeah, um, this was amazing. Uh, and thank you so much, Irene. I know startup life is hectic. And so your your time out of your day is, is super appreciated. Anika, this has really been my pleasure. It was awesome talking to you. I always enjoy talking to you. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to your audience. Um, and I hope we get to do a follow-up video. I do too. Thanks, Irene.